Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And today we are going to Tulsa, Oklahoma, of course. That's where everybody is focused on Tulsa. And this time last year, we did a video with Theo Alexander. And because for one thing, he is the only person I know that is a real live descendant of the people from Tulsa that were involved in the massacre. So Theo, Theo. hi. Hello Theo. everybody, how are you going, aloha. So you're all the way in Tulsa. Yes, coming how's live it, from the USA. <laughs> how's it going out there? Well, I mean, it's beautiful. You know, it's always good to be here amongst your, your friends and family that, that know you and watch you grow up. And um, given this turmoil of the times, I mean, it's good to see people still, you know, out fighting for the for the right, you know what I'm saying, to, to, to live and to enjoy, you know, uh, and to be in harmony, which we, we need a lot of that right now. Well, we do. Like. So tell me, is Tulsa getting ready for the orange man in the White House to come? What's well, it like? I would say yes, but really what Tulsa is preparing for is centennial of the 1921 race massacre riot. Um, yeah. So a as we um, approach the date next year, um, we're planning some things this year along with the Centennial Commission to, um, to be able to uh, show people what happened, what has happened since then, and what we're planning. So I don't think... Um, the gentleman in the White House has as much, you know, uh, credibility with us as far as what we're planning on doing <laughs> to uh, show that we're still alive. You know, we're still yeah. planning towards rebuilding Tulsa, and that's the focus right now. We have a lot of attention on Tulsa, maybe because he's coming, but um, but right now I'm focused on what Black Wall Street's going to do to rebuild. Well, now um, we're going to run the um, video that you and I did uh, this time last year where you talk about the whole, what happened. Because I've read a lot and I like what you said as a descendant and as someone that knows firsthand. So most of the stories are what somebody read and somebody wrote and oh, it, anyway. So uh, if you will stay with us okay. and uh, Eric is going to air some part of what we did last year. Okay. 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 Stand by. Was the Black Wall Street. So, Theo, thank you so much for coming back. Thank you for, for giving us a first hand account. You know, that because most of what we read is written by the conqueror, the people that actually created the riot, that we don't get a sense of what the riot was like, the massacre was like, except from people who, well, you're, you're as close to firsthand as yes. we can get, <laughs> but your ancestors, your family went through this. Yes. Now, Thanks. just to give you a background, this was 1921. And Tulsa at that time was that Greenwood? Is that, that was what it was? The Greenwood Good. District. In Greenwood. It was unbelievably successful. Yeah. It was a black neighborhood with doctors and lawyers and dentists banks, and pharmacists schools, and banks and schools, hospitals. hospitals, libraries. All of these were black owned. Yeah. Gorgeous place. And that's why it was called Wall Street, Black yes, Wall Street. and also Little Africa. Little uh, Africa. That was another nickname that was attributed, yeah. attributed to uh, Black Wall Street. So, so tell us about the success of, well, of this area. Okay. Black Wall Street um, was centered in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the districts of uh, the streets Greenwood, Archer, and Pine, with the streets are, you know, cordoned off the, the section of Black Wall Street. Uh, in the heyday, um, late 1800s up to 1900s, Oklahoma was started to welcome settlers uh, who were free black slaves uh, to open territory. This is prior to it being called Oklahoma. 
sell as a, a state. Um, it was a place where it was a place of refuge for a lot of people escaping the South and the tragic slavery situations that was going on with, along with the Jim Crow. And so they settled in Oklahoma, you know, Oklahoma, and they established Tulsa there, and Tulsa developed into what they call a black mecca. Uh, prior to any other state having any kind of considerable black wealth being shown um, as success, even during those times of oppression and slavery and things like that, and also coming out of World War One. Um, a lot of people from the war effort uh, brought their families there to settle. And the fortunate thing was uh, Oklahoma has a large oil reserve, also which has one of the best ports, one of the most successful ports. This is what contributed to the wealth, also, which was black owned. And it was considered the, the wealthiest place on the planet at that point in time in 1921 um, with the oil reserves and also with the success of the bankers and success of, um, of the doctors and lawyers, many of who contributed to first-time inventions or first-time surgeries, and things like that. Um, so we were very fortunate to have Oklahoma, or prior to Oklahoma's territory, um, to have that land um, below the Mason-Dixon line even, settled by successful blacks, and we were doing our thing back then. And yeah. so your family was in this area, in that Yes. In that city? Yes. Or town? Um, it, well, it was part of the city, but it was a district. Is that correct? Yes. It was, it was, it was part of Tulsa, north Tulsa. side of Tulsa. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the city grid of most states um, in the United States, only two, um, only two cities that are settled by blacks are set on the north side of town. North side is usually contributed to uh, Caucasian uh, wealth, and things like that. So Memphis, Tennessee, and Tulsa, Oklahoma was the only two cities that were set up in the north, which was the affluent section. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, my family came up from northern Texas in the early 1800s. We settled in around the Bristow and Langston area. And at the age of five, my parents moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is early 70s. And so we settled there, and, and we were, um, I wasn't aware of the Tulsa uh, massacre until the age of 13. Um, a lot of times it's Swept under the rug, like you said, the powers that be to tell the story, the newspaper owners and things like that, broadcast stations. Um, in that era in the United States, across the United States, there were similar events happening. I know you talked about the Elaine Massacre recently. Yes. Uh, you had Rosewood in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, you have a series of events happening in the early 1900s into the mid to the 1900s. And I would dare say that we still suffer from some of those things and some of those policies today, even as we see innocent black death being taken by a law enforcement officer and no regard for, yep. for black life. So how did this massacre begin? Um, the story goes, there was a gentleman by the name of Dick Rowland, which is an entrepreneur in the area. Um, because it was segregated um, at that point in time, you could only use certain bathrooms at the top of the tower where the incident occurred. Um, there was a restroom that was for color. So you had to take the elevator with an operator up to that where the restroom was on to be able to do that. So Dick Rowland, which is one of the young men who entered the elevator cart, and back then they had elevator operators, as oh, I said. I, I, uh, I believe that. the lady's name yeah. was Sarah Page, a uh, young white girl. And well, I, it, it's told that when Dick got onto the elevator, he missed his step because it was often practice to intimidate or oppress or you right. know, cause injury to blacks at any cost. And so it was said that the elevator operator stopped the floor prior to it leveling off, and when Dick Rowland walked onto the floor, he stumbled into her, and she let out a scream. Uh -huh. and at that point in time, um, if that occurred, and you were a black man, it was something dealing with a white person, you had some detriment oh, yes. coming your way, um, even your family. Yes. And so when that incident occurred, um, both of them exited the elevator, Dick went one way, she went the other way, and soon to come, a lynch mob formed to come apprehend him for assault. Or rape, that's what they were saying, of a young white girl you know, at that point in time. And it just transferred, transferred you know, from a lynch mob to uh, anger. Um, as far as the, uh, seemed like the whole county also convened on Black Wall Street at that point in time. With local law enforcement in collusion with, um, to, you know, the cordon off the street after the lynch mob had formed. And there was a series of incidents that happened. Um, black wealth was not to be taken for granted at that point in time. We knew the time that people were living in. And so 
we wanted to protect our wealth. And at that point in time in the United States, it was not illegal. Um, you know, you didn't get any kind of repercussion for killing blacks at that no. point in time. It was an you average still of, don't. Yes, it was an average of two blacks that were lynched a week, you know, even by a newspaper and postcard depiction. You know, that's how we know some of the things that were happening at that point in time. But so the people in Tulsa were not going to stand for that. So we had a lot of World War I veterans. There were a lot of entrepreneurs, the, the, the uh, pillars of the community, the, the, the pastors of the church, things like that. And there was an armed um, guard that stood guard at the courthouse or the jailhouse where Dick Rowland was being held. It was common practice for a lynch mob to come right to the steps of the judicial system or the courthouse, and the law enforcement would turn the person over mm -hmm. for them to be lynched in the public. So um, a series of lynchings had gone on prior to that week, and Tulsa was not going to stand for it. And so there was a shot fired. We don't know who fired the shot. There's many different stories that said, but white lynch mob, black mob protecting the life of Dick Rowland. And things transferred, you know, transpired after that. It was very drastic. So how long did it take? How long did all of this last? It lasts, um, I it, think, a series of four or five days total. Um, the first day being the most devastating because people were seeing the planning that went out. The National Guard was called in, martial law was called, and World War I veterans, you know, there were white Klansmen that were in the area with were very, very jealous, I guess you could say. They despised the wealth of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, when some of them were still living, you know, on dirt mattresses, mm -hmm. uh, what they call the hillbillies. And so at that point in time, you know, the Klan was very strong. The Klan was reinvigorated as a union group because there was a lot of out-of-work white right. male mm -hmm. um, World War I veterans. And so when they did collaborate. Um, they deputized those type of people, and they already had their guns from World War I because it was all common practice to bring guns with you. No one took them back. The government didn't want them, so you were able to take them, which enabled them to, you know, create a very devastating situation. You know, by having machine guns. Some of them were all pilots. They had their crop dusters. They dropped napalm and fire. Well, not napalm, but other means of high flammable, flammable uh, fluids. On some of the structures so they over bombed. there, they, they bombed Black Wall Street. This is why you see the destruction that was so vast. So oh. yes, they, they bombed it. But prior to bombing it, they went in and looted the wealth. You know, a lot of these people were jewelers. They were bankers. They were not impoverished people, and so they took that. You know. Oh boy, it's it's kind of yes, yeah. it's heart wrenching, but it, it is, happened. it is, and it was happening across the nation. It is. My mother was at Fisk University, yes. and she says there was a lynching every weekend. Yes. This is in Nashville. And she said there was a lynching every weekend just outside of town. Yes. And the mob would come, the local folks would come, and they would take souvenirs from yes. the lynch person, like with their yes. ears or whatever. Yes, and that was, that was what took place, the savagery that took place, because also with the Native Americans, you know, in the Indian Wars, they do the same thing by scalping and things like that. So taking silvers was something they intended to do. Um, and then the tragedy, even, is that when they were lynching, they would bring their children there to, to watch. And some of the postcards depicts the people smiling and having fun as someone was being roasted over a fire while being lynched at the same time. So we had a very, very savage history in our nation, but this is 1921, less than 100 years ago. We're coming up on the centennial of that right. event. And Tulsa's planning past that event. Black Wall Street never regained its wealth. Um, at this point in time, we're still investigating exactly how many people were murdered. And even upon the, the murder of so many, um, even when people went back to reclaim their, their own land and to borrow money to rebuild, there was ordinances and legislation put into place where insurance was not made available to any of the people who came back to reclaim their own property or to reclaim the property because of the massacre, um, because of the, the looting, because it was being burned down. So, you, so in, in effect, that was exactly what they intended to do, to just wipe it out. Yes. And, uh, you know. and so this kid was an excuse. 
He was definitely an excuse. They used him as a scapegoat. And Did they kill him? No, he was apprehended and he was also released. Dick Rowland, I do, I do believe he's still, uh, if he's not still alive, I'm not sure. Oh, but, of course, that was um, a long time yes, ago. Yes, but yeah. it, it was said that him and Sarah Page were actually a couple. She had just filed for divorce um, in the state she was coming from. And when she moved to Tulsa, she gained a job and she started dating and she was dating a, she didn't really understand that how strict it was. Sure she home. did. Well. <laughs> She never pressed charges on Dick. They tried to get her to press charges. She never pressed charges. But the mob ensued anyhow, using that as an excuse. Of course. Yes. But they actually have children together. Okay. They, they settled in another part of Oklahoma and actually had children. And I guess they lived their life, but um, that's an unknown story. I can't really verify that, but people in Oklahoma, we understand that. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That is such a story. We, um... I just want to put in a little caveat. You mentioned Native Americans. From the day that Christopher Columbus put foot on what is now the Bahamas and then into Cuba, and he saw the indigenous people, decided that they would make good slaves and took them back to Spain. But he also introduced diseases, which wiped out all of the Teanos. That they, they don't exist anymore. And from that day to this, we have had, and that includes Hawaii and Guam and every place else, we have had white supremacy and it marches and marches and marches across wherever they can go. Yes. And so, you know, and they, what they did to the Indians is just insane, just insane. Yes. So I'm I'm sure where you are in Tulsa, which was Indian land. Yes. Yes, I mean, it's it's very unfortunate that our 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 country has such a devastatingly horrific um, history when it comes to encounter with indigenous people. These are the people who made the land what it is. These are the people who made the land as beautiful as Columbus could imagine when he appeared, when he when he came up to the shores, and any other the uh, explorers that you know rediscovered whatever they rediscovered. But <laughs> my issue with it is what has been done since then. I mean, if you think about the chicken pox and the blankets and the trail of tears, if you think about what Columbus did with the tunnel, if you think about fairly recent past, the um, Tuskegee experiments, these are all things that were placed in front of us to run into in a, in a tra with a tragic outcome. Um, like today, COVID-19, not saying we're being targeted, but if you look at the states that opened up first, there were the Southern states. There were the states with a heavy population of uh, African-American people. And let me add this that no one mentions. Uh, they're also the states that did not take Medicaid. So those people have no Medicaid. No, no yeah. coverage. None. And today, if you encounter COVID-19 symptoms or anything else that would hospitalize you, it's almost a detriment to you to visit a hospital center, ER, or a health center, in fear of catching COVID-19 or not giving the, getting the resources or the services uh, to be able to combat it, you know, either as a healthy individual or someone who's compromised by their health pre-existing conditions. I mean, like you said, the Obama uh, care or... <clears throat> Affordable Care Act uh, policies have been rolled back to the point where we have millions of people back with no health insurance if you don't have a job. Some, even if you have a job, you can't afford it. So it's unfortunate that with these protests, and if you've seen any of the news currently, there's an uptick. Some of the states have doubled their number of new cases per day, Tulsa being one of the cities that are being, you know, discussed about that. And with this weekend coming with, um, you know, with 45 coming, it's going to be pretty, pretty bad. I mean, we have good, very good health resources here, hospital systems, uh, some of the best in the nation. But our health code and providing services to people who are of color or um, people who are, you know, foreign citizens and even people who are <clears throat> just in the minority status. You know, we've never had adequate health care across the nation. And people wonder why we are predisposed as far as conditions. 
and we're twice as likely to die of certain things, if not everything. COVID-19 is just another thing on the list, you know, and the lynching has always been, you know, we've always had to cope with the lynching part of it, but the disease part of it, we've kind of escaped, you know what I mean? So, but today, I don't know what's going to happen with this. I honestly, it is amazing to me. Uh, and then not only is it a deal of not having health care, but our people usually have those outside jobs, transportation, hospital uh, care, and nursing homes, and all of those things, uh, yeah. grocery stores, and those people that are essential. So they're yeah. out there, and that's where, you know, they don't get to go home and close the doors and, you know, work right. from home. Yeah. You know, and the, the myth of COVID-19, you know, as far as the African American population, we're having to battle that because if you remember <clears throat> back in January, and as it starts to progress through the nation and the, the death rate starts to go up, the uh, new cases, the diagnosis starts to go up as tests start to come in, people were actually saying that, and I was one of those people who was under the belief that maybe because melanin or any other advantage we have as far as our DNA and being healthy, uh, a healthy race overall, but I was under the impression that maybe it wouldn't affect us as much. You know, um, but now that we see we're getting diagnosed and dying at almost twice the rate as any other race. I don't, I, I'm just at a loss of words that people don't really take that serious, you know, and I, I, and I enjoy seeing and enjoy being a part of the protest for black life to matter. But what are we going to do when we don't get health services, when black lives don't matter? And um, that's a big thing across the country, not only for minority people, but people in general. Yes, for those states true. that denied Medicaid, yes. that does not affect just us, that affects everybody in the state. And those right. are mostly Southern states. Right. You know, not to detract from, from what the discussion is today, you know, the focus of Black Wall Street and 45 coming, it being Juneteenth, you know, um, I just caution everybody to, to take the safety precautions that's out in the CDC guidelines or the World Health Organization or your state or county health departments. Take it serious. Mask up, glove up if you can, you know, and, and, and enjoy Juneteenth by all means. But please don't render us any more uh, in jeopardy than what we already have with one side being the lynching than the other side being COVID-19 threatening our populations. Well, I think now, of course, you know, uh, you've known me long enough to know I would think this way, but the fact that they chose Juneteenth to have an event in any city, but on that day, and it's Tulsa. And then they moved the de a Republican convention to July in Florida in the same town on the same day that they had the ax handle massacre, exactly. July 27. Somebody in his uh, co concern or his office or whatever has to know that. That can't be a coincidence. That has to be more than a dog whistle. That has to be, we're here, you know, I mean, and calling attention to that. That, that can't be a coincidence. Yes, I mean, there's a lot of strategy that goes into presidential campaigns, as we know, and he's a very strategic person. I mean, my first introduction to Donald Trump was reality TV, being the king yes. of reality TV, and being, you know, very successful at that as far as building his enterprise off The Apprentice episodes. He had a very, you know, astute group of young people and older people later on in life when he started letting celebrities come on, but he had a pretty good group of people to build his empire on. And I think he redid that successfully. Mm -hmm. And now he can almost handpick who he wants to speak in the way he wants them to speak. And so I can't fault anybody for taking a check or making their living or doing anything. But in today's time, when black lives do matter, when you see a public lynching, you got to let that go. You got to get on the right side of history at this point. And with this rally, um, hopefully a lot of people can see through some of the antics that are being proposed. If you look at 
recent news and what's been happening with uh, his abil- inability to do any kind of foreign um, affairs uh, successfully, we have, we, we're on the brink of a civil war right in the United States. A lot of oh, nations yes. are facing this. Oh, yes, we are. And mm-hmm. uh, this is before we run out of time, give us the address of the centennial, the, um, what am I calling this now? It's the, um, the, the Black Wall Street um, Centennial. It's, it's actually the, the, the Tulsa 1921 Race Massacre um, Centennial Commission. They're and kind the of address crazy. is? Um, I, I would just give the website out. Um, yeah, we that website. Yeah, okay. so the website is Tulsa1921.org. Tulsa, T-U-L-S-A, 1921.org. You get all oh, the information great. of all the things that they're planning in the events and activities. Oh, that's wonderful. That's a good address. It's easy to remember. Right. right. Yeah. Well, I think we are about out of time, but I appreciate you spending this time with us again. Thank you for and having me. Now, I'm missing the islands over there, yeah? <laughs> well, we were doing pretty good with the COVID-19 until everybody insisted on having the tourists come back and now every day the numbers go up every day right right and that's and that's i think that's going to be across the nation that you know i'm looking at the map right now the, i mean that's a lot to say you're doubling the cases you know what i'm saying more so than you had before so well we didn't have we had four or five here five there yes none on lanai one on molokai but yes. every day now we have I mean, it's not like the mainland, but anyway, right. as mm-hmm. as we open up, we're bound to see more people. So right, right. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me, uh, Miss Joyner. It's always a pleasure to see you and visit with you, especially about issues of history and things that uh, particularly involve us as a people and our climb, our steady uh, <laughs> the uh, release of oppression, I guess you could say, getting <laughs> off of our neck. Uh, I'm glad to be alive in these days. You know, this is this it is, is good it to be is. a young black man um, to be able to see people realizing your life matters. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, again, I thank you so much, and you got to come back to Hawaii. Well, you just have to do that. You know, well, we miss I'll you. Believe that I will be there shortly. <laughs> Great. All Aloha. right. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Okay. And we'll see you next time.